Okay, up next we have my great friend Lisa. She's coming back up again from um, Florida International University. And we're gonna talk about creating a brand story from concept to implementation. Again, that's with Associate Professor Lisa Kane. Come on out. Welcome once again, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Lisa Kane. I am an associate professor with the Chaplin School of Hospitality and Tourism Management at Florida International University. And I would like to welcome you to creating a brand story. During our time today, we will be discussing what is sustainable and what is not when creating a brand, how the process works from conceptualization to going live, and how to stay involved to make sure it all gets pulled through. I have three esteemed panelists with me today, and I will let them introduce themselves, starting with Tiffany. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tiffany Cooper. I am the head of development for Kimpton Hotels and Restaurants. I am hopeful that you are familiar with Kimpton. We are the <laughs> preeminent uh, boutique hotel brand, uh, really launching the space almost 43 years ago when our founder, Bill Kimpton, started his first hotel in San Francisco. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here with you today. And I'm Jennifer Barnwell. I'm president of Curator Hotel and Resort Collection. We're a collection of independent uh, and boutique hotels. And prior to that, I was an asset manager with Pebble Brook Hotel Trust for about 10 years. And we have a lot of Kimptons, <laughs> so we go back. Yes. Hi, I'm Yossi Loeb. I'm the CEO of the Regency Group which is the headquarters is in New York City, and we have offices in Miami, Los Angeles, Chicago, and London. We are trusted and recognized as an e-supplier for the hotel industry um, globally, for the luxury, boutique, and urban hotels, and our, we specialize in bringing your brand to life. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. It's an honor and a privilege. Let's start with you, Tiffany. Can you discuss Kimpton's approach to your hotel branding and storytelling? Sure, so, um, so and we actually have some visuals for you to, to walk you through some of these um, processes. Um, so, you know, Kimpton, we originally started as an urban brand. Uh, we, I think we were the largest developer of adaptive reuse uh, historical buildings um, in, in, here in the U.S. And when you're looking at um, a, a, you know, a building that has historic uh, roots, the story is uh, a little easier to tell because you really just, you try to remove the layers and let the building um, uh, tell the story. When you're starting with a new hotel, it's a little bit more complicated because you just have nothing but white space, but also therein lies the opportunity. So over the last decade or so, we've been doing a lot more uh, new build properties. And we really take an anthropological approach to, um, to looking at the market. So we really try to do a deep dive into, okay, what, is, what really is needed? We always want to stay local. We always want to be relevant. We always want to be timeless. We don't look at demographics. Um, we really want to appeal to everybody. And we don't want to be trendy, uh, but we want to understand the trends. Um, so we have a process that um, we lovingly call um, the muse. And the muse is this aspirational, fictional character uh, that really is for us the guiding light for our properties. Um, think of it in terms of your why or, or the soul of the property. And we try to come up with this fictional character that really will be the guiding light um, throughout the, the process of, of, of uh, opening and really um, as we are operating the property. Now, I have a, a slide of our Kimpton Muse, but for each and every property, we come up with our own Muse. And they are very varied, and they're very different. Um, and, and when we're thinking about the Muse, we never want it to be the hotel guest that's staying there. Um, we, we found that 
people like to come and stay at our hotels and try on different lifestyles. So maybe there's one or two people in the hotel at any given time that resembles the Muse. Um, and if there's more than that, then we haven't strived high enough to really kind of embody what this Muse character is. So from, from identifying what the Muse is, and we get, we get very granular, we give the Muse a name, um, we go into some demographics, but we know where they love to shop and we know what they love to drink. Um, you know, what does the muse do on a Thursday night? What does the muse, uh, tr you know, have for breakfast? Um, so with each property, we have a different muse. Um, we have a property in, in Palm Springs, the Rowan. Um, she's very boho chic. And so, of course, uh, we have uh, kombucha on tap for, uh, for our coffee hour. So we're able to take what this muse uh, personality is and then thread it through um, through the property. I think you can go to the, actually the next slide. So, um, so Kimpton has identified these pivot points where we know we show up for the guests and they're moments of style and uh, spirit and delight. So our, you know, our Kimpton hotels have always been known for the wine hour, but as we've adapted over the last 40 something years, we have now a social hour. So our Muse process, if you're, once you're identified, we can pull that through each and every touch point. Our Muse in um, Beverly Hills, uh, she likes to drink Prosecco. So that's what we serve at our social hour. I mentioned at the Rowan, um, she drinks kombucha on tap. So this is a, just, it's a very clever way to be able to identify how to program the property. Um, and it also keeps everyone on property focused on what they're doing every single day. Um, I'm, a, you know, previous life I was in operations. I have opened hotels and everyone is very excited when they open a hotel. They're very focused, they understand the why, but then people move on and there's turnover. So what the Muse allows uh, is for everyone on property, regardless of when you get to the property, to understand how you are going to show up for the guests. So when you have a general manager that starts, if they like the color purple, you don't see purple showing up all throughout your lobby. You have to go back to the muse and say, okay, how should we show up for the muse um, from, a, from a design perspective? And this, this whole muse branding process starts after our design. So being a design-led brand, once we have the design identified, then we back into the Muse, and the Muse then identifies the branding and the naming and everything else. So it's a very, um, it's a very cohesive process. I think this is probably the reason why Kimpton um, uh, uh, feels so authentic, because there's nothing forced about the branding. There's nothing forced about the programming. These are not just ideas that we come up with our head. These are really kind of aligned, and everyone on property is aligned. And once they have the Muse, we're not giving everyone a standard operating uh, procedure manual saying this is what you need to do. We're saying, okay, this is the Muse, and this is how you have to uh, uh, program your hotel. We have a property in Chicago called The Gray, and our Muse uh, for that property, he loves Shinola watches. So we were able to have a pop-up where we allowed the guests to borrow a Shinola watch, and if they liked it by the end of the stay, they could buy the watch. So just different things that we're able to pull in using the Muse as our um, focal point. We actually have one of our general managers here, Jeremy, from the Hotel Palomar in Phoenix. And I'm going to call you out, Jeremy, and ask you what the name of your muse is for, um, for the Phoenix Palomar. Ava. <laughs> Ava, OK. And um, how, how, uh, tell us a little bit about Ava. Uh, well, uh, Ava is, uh, is divorced, two kids. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> makes $450,000. She works in finance from Chicago, but loves to visit Phoenix for work and for play. Uh, very much into music and the art scene, which uh, is, is relevant to why she stays in downtown Phoenix. Uh, she loves Porsche, aviation gin, um, mm. and ultimately her kids, but loves to have a girl's getaway that turns into uh, to a, a, 
a week of work uh, on the front end. Thank you. So that's a perfect example. So, and everyone on property knows Ava. So every single one of our Kempton properties has this muse. And it doesn't mean that we're going to always use that muse. So oftentimes, uh, you know, properties will renovate. So we'll go back to the muse process and say, okay, is it the same muse or, or should we change the muse? Should we freshen the muse? So it really, again, is a, it's a really um, fantastic way to, to tell a story, to, to, to pull the story through. I absolutely love that. What a what a great iterative process, and um, it really does. Yeah. So um, sorry, I forgot no, one other okay. slide. Um, so <laughs> once we have the muse, every property gets one page, just one, because we know people don't read anything, um, <laughs> but they can read one, one page. So we have a brand dashboard that will present that has the muse, that has the style of delight um, listed. So again, it, everyone kind of is very focused on the why of their property. And again, I just think it keeps Kimpton, um, really tight and it allows us to deliver, um, an exceptional guest, uh, experience. I think it's a great way to story tell. Um, Jennifer, how has Pebblebrook Hotel Trust approached the development of its independent properties and how do you also have, some, and do you also have some examples from your current role with Curator? Yeah, sure do. Uh, so as I said earlier, I as, was an asset manager with Pebblebrook for about 10 years. So I had the good fortune to work on quite a few independent transformations. And um, it's kind of, you know, one of two things. Sometimes at the time of acquisition, we kind of already had a vision, kind of the direction we wanted the property to go. And we'd collaborate with our interior designer and the rest of our team members to bring that to fruition. You know, but sometimes we didn't know kind of what direction we wanted to take. So we'd present the property to kind of our favored interior designer that was incredibly creative, you know, and have her and her team present, you know, maybe two or three options to us, or and maybe we'd mix, you know, two of the options together to, to get where we needed to be. And so it just goes back to we, we always start with a story or a concept and we work really hard with the team to make sure it's pulled through every aspect of the renovation process. So that goes to, you know, everything is thoughtful. And I can tell you unequivocally, our CEO touches everything. <laughs> Tiffany probably knows that he too. Does. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about it's pulled through every fabric, every paint color, you know, every piece of furniture, the wall covering, the art, and art can take so many different forms now, whether it's you know, a piece of art that's on the wall that's painted by someone or sculpture, you know, lighting, flooring, you can, you know, you name it. Every aspect, you know, does have, um, ha have a part in telling that story, or at least that's the way we approach it. You know, in terms of the slides, you know, I'll start with this first one here. This is just kind of in my mind, a f just a very few examples of what we think are kind of distinctive in some of our, um, and when I say art, I'm talking about Pebble Brooks um, independent properties. So kind of the first two pictures and then the one, the first one on the left, there are a couple different pictures related to these area rugs that we put in our hotels at a property in downtown San Francisco. I mean, this goes back, we were doing this project in 2012 and 2013. Um, and these were um, a series of Persian rugs. We pulled, you know, we found Persian, used Persian rugs from villages in India, Turkey, and Pakistan. You know, obviously the washing process, we cut them, we had them cut, we had them hand sewn back together. So every uh, guest room had its own distinctive area rug that has a lot of history and a lot of storytelling to it. Um, in our Hotel Ziggy, which is the newest of kind of what we call our unofficial Z collection hotel in West Hollywood, we got really creative with vinyl record covers. Um, kind of in the middle at the top is the courtyard at Hotel Zephyr. So we actually, that's also at the wharf in San Francisco, we filled in the outdoor pool and created this kind of amazing, playful outdoor courtyard area that's full of oversized games and creative fire pits. Um, the sculpture on the top right is from this amazing artist that our interior designer found. His name is Brian Mock, and he creates sculptures out of found metals. So this one happens to reside in the lobby at Hotel Zealous. 
but we have quite a few of his pieces of work in, in the Pebble Brook hotels, and we've commissioned everything from dogs to some human forms, a giant seagull, and if you can believe it, a life-sized Paul Revere on a life-sized horse that's in our Revere Hotel in Boston. It is quite a sight to see. I don't even know how we did it and how we got it in the hotel. <laughs> But it is, it's just something special and it, it, it was really organic. Like we found, we found him and put a dog in the lobby at Hotel Zeta and had a lot of fun with it on social media. And then it just, we ended up thinking there's a place for one of these sculptures in every one of our independent hotels. Like it's so cool, it's such a, you know, a, a talking piece. And then the picture in the bottom middle, um, these are the tree houses at Skamania Lodge. So, you know, Pebble Burka's ownership, um, has stewarded this property to a much more, uh, you know, higher level, you know, going from kind of a remote, you know, rustic lodge to something that's much more closer to luxury, almost luxury in terms of all the redevelopment they did there. And these are very high end, beautiful tree houses that, you know, live within the trees in the forest um, up at Skamania Lodge. And I mean, that's the picture. Whenever we talk about Skamania Lodge, like that's what comes up and, you know, that's what we are, you know, we're trying to create these amazing um, vignettes and experiences and storytelling and all those kind of things. Um, the second slide is fun with logos. <laughs> so we, at Pebble Brook and my asset management days, we work with this amazing branding firm and it's so fun, you know, and these are, you know, the final picks, but of course there were like four or five or sometimes six to choose from, all different color schemes. You know, some of these I, you know, worked on, I'm very proud of them. Um, some of those are from curator hotels that we think are fantastic logos as well. So again, it's just about carrying it through everything you do and the logos can be a really fun part of that and something distinctive, you know, that you can obviously have everywhere, not only your website, but on all, all of your collateral and your amenities and, you know, things like that. And then the third slide, is, um, I know Yossi's gonna get to in a second, but don't forget about collateral. <laughs> um, also a very important part of what we view as the redevelopment and renovation process. We do it early on, kind of as soon as, you know, the interior design starts to get solidified. We do think about the os &E pieces and the collateral, and it's either part of the interior designer scope of work or we use a third party for the design and the ideas like a branding firm, but everyone kind of has oversight over it and we wanna make sure again that everything pulls through. So some of these examples here, like in the middle, um, the Leiden was a project that didn't end up happening because the owner sold the property, but we had a ton of fun um, with this kind of underground punk theme. So, you know, these are the door hangers in the middle, and then we had, you know, a lot of fun with kind of bags and record players and, you know, other amenities that could be in the room. And the lower left-hand corner was us, you know, having some fun with the uniforms at Hotel Zeppelin in San Francisco. So the bellmen wore embroidered jean jackets and beanie hats, and the room attendants wore track suits, which I personally love track suits, so we thought that was like kind of fun and comfortable and different. Um, and then just keeping with the theme of Zeppelin on the right hand side, you know, these were the posters related to the reopening and the launch of the hotel. Um, the below that on the right is some piece of collateral that was in the room. And again, it's the background is similar, but different colors and the logos there are very distinctive. And then we did a whole concert series with some of the Z hotels in the Pebble Book portfolio. And, you know, this is basically uh, concert promotion. So um, we had the same bands play at Hotel Xena in DC, and then they went to Hotel Ziggy on the Sunset Strip in West Hollywood, and they've also been to Hotel Zeppelin in San Francisco. So just the collaboration among the Z's and logos, and just you know continually using these pieces and pulling them through so that you know the awareness builds and the in the branding is you know legitimized. On the curator side of things, just really quickly, I'll mention one. Um, I didn't work on it, but it's an amazing project. It's called the Catbird Hotel in Denver that was done by Sage. And, you know, in their own words, it's an independent boutique that's full of art, heart, and good vibes. They blur the line between hotel and home. 
They have a very high percentage of long-term guests and month-to-month -month renters. Um, the rooms have kitchenettes. The rooms um, have these platform beds that there's you know, three or four steps you have to walk up to get into it, and there's drawers underneath, and I'm told the whole design is patented, which is like I hadn't heard that before <laughs> about a hotel bed, but all very cool and interesting, and they've been winning design awards for it, like most innovative hotel design from Independent Lodging Congress and gotten you know, a whole lot of press about doing something different you know, in the hotel space and in this really vibrant up and coming, you know, area in Denver. Fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. And, you know, obviously we've heard from both Tiffany and Jennifer that props are very important <coughs> in storytelling. So Yossi, when developing products for hotel partners, what tactics have you found effective for ensuring that the brand's story is perpetuated? What is the interaction with branded companies and independent properties? So I'll be the one who's going to talk from the other side of the spectrum, right? So after all these fun designs are done, um, usually we come in and we are sometimes the spoilers as well. So we're like, okay, this looks great on digital and it looks very fun and all that, but when it comes to bring it out into a product or onto paper or onto whatever it's going to be in the end, we've got to make sure that nothing goes to waste. So when we go, the first thing is we always ask, can we see the brand guidelines as early as possible, even though it's not fully developed so we understand what the expectations are and what we're here to make it happen with. Sometimes the, the specs are not the same way as it is done in the end, so we come in and we guide with it how it should be done and what should be done to bring out what the brand is there to represent as. So while we ask for the brand guidelines, we also ask for the style guidelines, so which is very important, so we try to integrate both of them all together. And then we go for product sampling. Either we ask a hotel that we come in, that's, we take over item by item, do you have existing product that you did like but you didn't like? Or we come up with a product sampling. Is this what you have in mind? Is this what you envision? Or can we do it something different? How about we do it like this? Or how about we do it a different way? So a lot of times from when we start on it until we end up, it's a whole different product. And then we ask as well, what are the comps in your area? Which demographical kind of clientele you're trying to get as guests? Or what are you trying to represent with what you're trying to bring on here? Because a key holder, a key card, they're, key, they're just here to work. From the other end, if it's designed correctly, it ties in the whole experience to the guest with it as well. So we review collections from similar properties. A good example, a lot of people are saying, oh, we like how the Mark Hotel did it. So we did it with their exceptional work, and we do their stuff for like at least 10 years now. From beginning to end, from a change of a branding, everything gets changed simultaneously as it goes. So some a lot of things depend in the end. How did you execute that? The colors are different here. How is it done here? How is it done there? So it all works together in the end. And then we work very much as well with the philosophy of the hotel. What are you trying to bring out? Like what Jennifer and Tiffany both said, but both are there, the Muse, uh, the Kimpton hotels, and by the other hotels, how everything is in the end, artsy and decorative. Okay, so we work accordingly with that. How can we bring out and help elevate the message with the pieces of the collateral that we're going to help create and produce? So once we have all of that together, we'll be able to put in, to putting it all together and making it all happen. And the best thing after that is, from seeing it visual on a, on a screen, it's very, it looks beautiful. The product itself, a lot of times, comes out differently. So ourselves as well, and then we, we communicate with the hotels simultaneously. We do product audits once or twice a year. How is the outcome of this? Did the guest in the end engage with it, with the branding? Or is it just another piece? How can we elevate and do it different that it becomes something else? The key holder is too wide or it's too small, it's too narrow. We want to add more things. We want to do it differently. It's the same as our neighboring hotels. How can we stand out? So according to that, we change and elevate a lot of pieces as it goes. So that's on that. And then what role? Sure, so um, we've heard a little bit about this, but I'd love for you to elaborate on what the role of physical products have in telling the brand story. So it goes back to the philosophy of the hotels, which you know better than me, it comes back to the five senses, which is basically the, the, the sight, sound, scent, touch, and taste. So we always try to bring in with the, with the, produ with the products that it goes accordingly and it, and it fills in with the philosophy of the brand. So sight is obviously how the product looks like. What is the end product? 
coming out to be f to, to what you envision it to be with. Scent is, is the basically when you walk into the hotel, every hotel has the custom fragrance and every hotel has the custom scent. There's numerous collections about it and where people that go home they just love what they had and they tie in with it. And then there comes the touch, which is basically when you feel a product, it could be done in a lot of different kind of ways. Sometimes if a, even just a business card feels different, you connect with it and you know, oh, okay, I see they did put in an effort to bring out their brand with it. Same thing goes in any kind of different stationery, and it goes even more from foil to regular ways how to do it, from four color process to regular ways of printing or not. And then the same thing goes on the rest of the room collateral, how you tie it in together, the dry amenities, the packaging of it, the, the wet amenities, the, the, the terry, the linen, the slippers. There's, uh, people think a slipper is such an easy thing, you just put in a pair of slippers and you move on. There's so many, me, myself, you know, I'm still surprised how many more we can come up with. There's so many different styles, shapes, looks, feels, materials, from going plush to going eco to going any kind of direction which basically ties in the property with feeling it and, and touching what you bring in with that. Then comes the taste, which goes back to the old traditional kind of way, which still putting down a, a, a custom-made chocolate, either on premises from the chocolatier in the hotel or custom-made for that hotel or a VIP amenity um, package with a nice note card. It takes the memory back and the guest goes home with it and stays with them. Oh, I wish I could go back to that hotel and have that experience again. And they do that. And then that spreads the word and brings back the guest with it. So our role is to make sure that the money and the time that all the hoteliers here and other invest in it, that it brings out and connects with it. So that's the key of branding and being in the know and knowing how to produce it and having a reliable source with it to make it happen. So in the end, the physical products and experience that leaves in the end a memory mark and makes it happen. Yeah, I mean, the worst thing is to be totally forgettable, right? So it's like, um, I think the physical products are super important and definitely an important part of the storytelling. And, you know, think about it if you go into a guest room and it's just completely plain, you know, or there's no products or, you know, nothing with a logo on it or, you know, even, I mean, you guys, we all travel so much, right? And you go to grab the laundry bag at some kind of cheap old, you know, generic laundry bag versus, you know, if the property actually took the time and spent a little extra money, you know, working with great vendors that can provide these things. If you have your logo on everything, I just think it makes a difference and it makes it feel like you took the time to think about it and you're on kind of every touch point that you possibly can. Well, I think everything communicates. I mean, everything communicates. So, and it's, it's the physical, um, the things that you can see and that you're aware of. And then there's those intangibles that you, you're not really picking up on the cool neo jazz that's playing, but you're like, wow, this is different. Um, and the lights, the lighting is so critical. Um, I was, uh, I was in Austin a few weeks ago and I was meeting with a developer and they were so excited to show me their, their product and it was really great. Um, and then after a couple of glasses of wine, I had the courage to say, you really need to work on your lighting and bring that down because they had this um, elevator that just was so bright. It was almost, uh, you almost view it in terms of a portal, right? Uh -huh. So you're in this great space and then you get in this bright fluorescent elevator where you could barely see and it's like, you need to pull that back and then it'll be great. Um, but everything <laughs> communicates, everything communicates. Um, so, and you know, I loved, I love the uniforms, the, the track suits, and um, for, for so many years when I do panels, I say something all the time, but I think it's really true, which is um, we are, uh, as hoteliers, we're, um, we are not great at innovating, but we're really good at imitating. And it's, and it's so true, we see what's cool and then we start uh, copying it. Mm -hmm. So to really to be able to, to think out of the box and look at every aspect of your property and, um, and, and see how everything is communicating the tangibles and the intangibles is really, um, it's what makes that, it's that extra 10% that you just don't really know why you love it. You can't really explain it. Um, it's, it feels intuitive, uh, but it, it's what makes these, uh, these hotel experiences special. Well, we've heard about what makes a cohesive story, 
and what makes a cohesive and positive brand. But do any of our panelists, maybe I'll start with you, Tiffany, have any things that they might share or be able to share that went wrong? Um, what doesn't work and why doesn't it work? Yeah, so I mean, we, we're not, I mean, we're not always right on all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to learn and, and the way sometimes you learn are by doing certain things. I mean, we've had it, um, I mean, I think in general we, we we do it right most of the time, but um, every once in a while there will be initiative. I think there was something, there's one of our resorts, we were uh, launching this, you know, green fire ceremony and it was going to happen, um, you know, like four o'clock in the afternoon before, you know, earlier than sunset. But people had been drinking all day and people wanted to go back to their room and they wanted to get showered and take a nap and the timing was really off. And so we really had to kind of go back and, um, rework that and figure out the right the right timing and the the, the setup for that. Um, we also had a really fantastic initiative that many of you probably remember about Kimpton. Um, it was uh, the Guppy Love program that we had with the old the, gold, the goldfishes that we used to put in um, in the guest rooms, and that was you know really charming and innovative. Um, but I don't know that the 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 animal groups uh, liked it, so we ultimately had to discontinue it, which was totally fine. And we uh, rehomed many of those fishies to um, to happy places, so they turned out okay. But it's just one; it's another example of how, um, as a as a lifestyle brand, as a you know, in the boutique or independent space, you have to um, you have to continually stay fresh, and sometimes you have to kind of, you know, retire things and move on to the next. And um, so we retired our. I still think it's super charming, but um, uh, but you know, there's there's uh, lots of other programs out there that we've been, uh, that we've taken on that have replaced it. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Uh, I thought about this for a while, and it's not. And again, nobody's perfect. I can't think of anything that like per se went horribly wrong. I would just say that, you know, thankfully the organizations I've worked in, we've always been really supportive of er experimentation. So it's like try things, especially with these independent boutique hotels. You know, there's a lot of flexibility there. You know, try things, see what works, see what doesn't. And um, I keep going back because I worked on them for so many years, the, the Z hotels when I was at Pebblebrook. And it was, you know, we were, you know, putting this kind of group of hotels together, you know, pretty organically and trying to be a little bit different and kind of rebels to a certain degree, but each had their own story. And it was like one of the key aspects of these hotels on the operations side was you need to have events and activations. I mean, funded by the hotel, try to get hotel guests down, try to get the community in. And what I tried, you know, what I tried to convey was have patience and try things and see what works because it takes time for things to build sometimes. So, you know, we were doing, one hotel, we were doing these kind of innovative fashion shows in the restaurant space and it's like, okay, maybe you don't get that many people at the first one, but keep doing it and the word will get out. And we had these amazing um, drag events at another hotel that, again, not everybody likes, but that's okay. Like, try to do something different and interesting and, you know, off the wall and just, just see how it's, um, how it's received. And kind of my other but totally separate note on this kind of question is you just got to really pay attention. So, you know, so much work goes into the front end of redesign and renovation and branding, and you got this brand book and the one pagers with Kimpton. But if you don't pay attention, things fall apart real fast. So it's always like, always revisit with the teams. Are you following, you know, the branding? If the branding is off in a couple aspects, let's talk about it because no one's perfect. Like we've gone in and there's been some kind of design element that just like, isn't durable or just like doesn't work. So we have to change it out. For some reason, it seems like it's always in the elevator. <laughs> so, you know, we've changed out elevator design, multiple things, because we never get thing, every single thing right. So put it all in place, reopen, do everything you can. And then in a few months, you know, talk to your teams and find out what's working and what's not, and then make those changes and, you know, move on from there. So I'm going to come from the other side of the spectrum again. 
It boils down to the dare or don't you dare. Everybody wants to be innovative with their products. So I'll take a good example. What did for a hotel, um, besides being one of the most uh, more eco concepts as well, they want, we figured out a way how we can do, um, we found a manufacturer for it with all that, uh, old tire into a coaster. And if, then we did it into a door hanger as well. And we've never done before, right? So it comes down, it boils down to a tire and then smells like a tire. <laughs> so we put it out, people are like, I'm not putting my drink on that. <laughs> really? It smelled horribly. So then we re-innovated it a little bit differently and we let it dry out and then for over a month and a half. So every time we restock it and we redo it, we spread them all out, we let them dry out, and we came up with a voice on it as well. I used to be a tire. So it made it more fun and innovative as well, uh -huh. but that comes with the changes with it. And the same goes for door hangers. Um, we, we did a lot of times door hangers, we were doing it made out of cork to go, to go be, to be a little bit different. But cork is not a, a, a sustainable product that it's sustainable from, from eco side, but it rips. Mm. It's not something that holds for long. So they did it first with like a cutout on it and it ripped after being on the, it's an, and, it, and it's an expensive product as well. So it got ripped after being just on the door for like maybe five visits. And then they kept on reordering. I'm like, guys, something needs to change over here. I have no issue, but something needs to change over here. So then we changed it, we did it with a string in the end and we did grommets on the side. So mm. a lot of these things, because it's innovation and it's tying it into with, with, with the brand, it comes as Jennifer and Tiffany mentioned, you try it out first and then you keep on fixing it. But with the experience that we bring with it, it brings a lot of times you can say, oh no, it's not gonna work. And they're like, why? I'm like, trust me, it's not gonna work. <laughs> but you know, I think it's funny because I think many of these um, initiatives, brand initiatives are, you know, it's the, the creative people, it's the, the commercial team and the sales people. And then, um, and then, then we hand it over to the operators. like. Um, like Jeremy, who's our general manager, Maria is back there, who opens all of our hotels. And they're like, this, this is not gonna work. Like this isn't, we're gonna have to do it. We can get it to there, but you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to re take this in different steps and you're have to, gonna do this, this and this. And so it's really the combination of the two and ultimately it makes it better because you have this brilliant marketing idea or initiative and you have the operator that actually can get it done and make it functional. And it's really the marriage of, it's an art and it's, and it's a science. Since it is an art and a science, I think that I'm going to actually ask Yossi the last question, which is how do you prioritize product quality, timeliness of delivery and cohesion to brand story? And obviously all of our panelists, but I think it starts with you and then it works its way back into the hotel. Which is so. a great question. And we usually, thanks for asking that. And we usually get asked that question right away when we start with any new brand. How do we know that you're gonna be able to deliver it? So the first thing we go is understand the brand, gui brand guidelines and the vision and all that. Then we start seeing what was already designed and we break it down, what gets done locally, what gets done overseas. What gets done, what is a new innovative concept that needs a lot of samples made to see what needs to be changed, what needs to be done differently. Um, we're doing the Hoxton mugs for an example. And by every property to do a different, it's a two-tone color mug and inside it's custom, uh, custom, voice, custom tags, custom voice lines for every property separately as well. So we need to do multiple different tests to we'll get the correct bottom color and the voices in there correctly, it's super custom. So when we, any Hoxton, we do the openings for, we're like, before we even talk about anything else, give us the colors for the mugs. The mugs. Because we know that's <laughs> gonna be the pain in the end that's gonna either arrive four months in, or it's okay if it arrives a month before, but let's start with that. So by knowing what goes where and how long it takes to produce, if it's something that's super innovative, we put that straight away on an Excel sheet and we share it around. These are the items we first got to cross out. It takes a long time. There will be a lot of samples in the middle. The other items, it's just a few weeks. We'll make it happen and, and, and work with it. And then comes in how, how we engage it with the brand as well. Sometimes we can have, we're thinking of doing this and this and this. How about, so that's where we come in as well. No, none of these will work. So we got to go to a different, here's a different set that we can work with. Then they come, okay, so, these are confirmed, so then we take every sector, we divide it basically in four sectors. Front desk, in rooms, food and beverage, F&B, and sales and marketing. 
for every sector we go, what are the confirmed items? Here's the timelines for it, let's start on that. What are the non-confirmed items that we're still dabbling around with? What could the hotel open with not having it and just comes in after? What, what is for the hotel for operational needed literally from day on, which obviously is usually keys, key holders, luggage checks, those kind of things. So by dividing it all in those sectors and setting the expectations right is our key how we make it all happen in the end. So it all boils down in the end to one word, setting expectations right. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I'll just take, I'll put the ownership hat on. I think, um, you know, there's a budget for every project, right? So, you know, it, combine the budget and your timeline and you want to be on time and on budget, you know, that whole saying. And there's a little wiggle room in both usually and you always have your contingencies in your budget. But, you know, the approach, you know, I've always been a part of is, um, Maybe you can't spend an, a ton of money on everything. You know, maybe, you know, take os &E, for example. You can't go, you know, the highest price and the highest quality on all 100 things, but you're gonna pick a subset of things that you think are the highest touch items and will make the most impact. I mean, that's just reality. Everybody lives, you know, within a budget depending on your investment parameters. Um, and I think, you know, the other part of it is you know, once you get past opening, then it goes to the operating budget, and that's a collective effort. I mean, you don't want to be the type of, I mean, I just don't, you know, want to be the type of owner asset manager that's pushing so hard and reducing costs so much that everything that you work so hard on to launch a property just disappears. You know, so you gotta, you gotta go into these projects understanding what it is gonna take to maintain them. And when you were talking earlier, I thought about, you know, going back to Hotel Zeta way back when, you know, we did um, the model room and then we did the whole renovation. We're getting close to opening, you know, and the operator took me aside and he was like, you know, there's a lot of paint <laughs> everywhere in these public areas. I hope you're gonna give me a painting line item, you know, in your budget. And I said, uh, well, of course, yes, because this is the look we want. This is the feel we want um, and we've got to maintain it. So it, it's always kind of a balancing act from, you know, my perspective from the owner's seat. Um, but you don't want to be so tight, you know, with the money and the budget if you don't have to be, because then you'll wipe out, you know, all the effects that you wanted to make in the first place. But there has to be a return on investment. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, if it's not going to be ge revenue generating or guest enhancing, then don't do it. Um, and, you know, Kimpton, prior to the IHG acquisition eight years ago, um, we were owners and we were developers, so we understand returns. Um, and even though we, um, we're, you know, the brand and management now, we still look at everything through that lens of ownership. And um, if it's not going to enhance guest experience, if it's not going to enhance returns, um, then it's probably not worth doing it, even if it is like the greatest idea ever, if we can't find, um, the return on investment then uh, probably isn't going to get done. Agreed. Well, Yossi, Jennifer, Tiffany, thank you so much for sharing how to create a brand story with our online audience, our in-person audience. Thank you to the ILHA for putting on the Inspire Conference and for hosting this uh, talk today. Thank you all so Thanks much. Thank you.